Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us for today's coffee chat. I'm very happy to have Merle Crawford and Barbara Weber with us here today to talk about um, intervention, everyday interventions for young children with autism. So before we get started, um, I just have a few housekeeping things to go over. Um, on your screen, you'll see some webinar tips um, just to help improve your viewing experience today. So if you have any applications that are open, um, such as email or other internet browsers, um, if you close those, that can help um, allow for some more bandwidth for your viewing of today's webinar. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, there's a questions tab in your webinar panel, and you can type those questions in, and then towards the end of the webinar, we'll be taking those. Um, and then if you'd like to minimize your webinar panel, there's a little orange arrow at the top of the panel. You can click that and that will um, get, get rid of the panel. And then if you click that again, it'll expand the panel so you can enter any questions that you have. And if you're experiencing any um, audio issues, you can click on the audio tab in your webinar panel and there's an option for phone audio and it'll give you a number to dial in. Um, so if you have any issues with your computer audio. So Merle and Barbara are co-authors of Autism Intervention Every Day. Uh, this practical guide is packed with simple, highly effective um, suggestions for promoting the development of children birth to three uh, with red flags for autism. And you can find more information about that book here at this bit.ly. And then we will also be doing a book giveaway. Um, so we are giving away three free copies of Autism Intervention Every Day. Uh, three attendees will be selected at random and then you'll be emailed after the webinar. So go ahead and submit your questions into the panel um, to increase your chances of being selected as a winner. And you'll also be prompted to complete a short survey. Um, at the end of this webinar, once everything closes out, there'll be a little prompt for you to complete a survey. So we'd love to know your thoughts on this webinar and you'll be entered for a chance to win um, another copy of Autism Intervention Every Day. And last but not least, um, everyone in attendance today will be receiving a certificate. Um, the certificates, you'll receive a link for that in, an, in a follow-up email tomorrow. Uh, however, at the end of the webinar, we'll also provide a link if you'd like a more personalized certificate um, that references a coffee chat and the name. Um, so we'll have a link for that at the end. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Merle and Barbara. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction. So our learning objectives today are to learn about the, our model for core deficits of autism, to discover which skills are associated with the four components of the model. And those four components are social communication, flexibility, regulation, and making sense of self, others, and the environment. Also to understand the relationship between the components of the model and to come away with effective new strategies for facilitating skills within daily routines such as mealtime, bath time, and playtime. We're going to start by looking at a model Barb and I developed which was inspired by what we know about autism and what we encounter day after day during our sessions with children and families. The model shows the interrelationship between making sense of self, others, and the environment, social communication, flexibility, and regulation. Each component influences the other and is influenced by the other. We're going to talk more about each of these areas throughout our chat, but first I want to talk about how these correlate to the diagnosis of autism. Professionals who make the diagnosis of autism do so based upon descriptors in the DSM-5. The first one is persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction across multiple contexts. Under this in the DSM, the first one is deficits in social emotional reciprocity. And in our model, that correlates with social communication. Deficits in nonverbal communicative behaviors used for social interaction, again, social communication. Deficits in developing and maintaining and understanding relationships, again, social communication as well as making self sense of self, others, and the environment. Another descriptor is restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities. Under that, stereotype repetitive motor movements, use of objects or speech, social communication, making sense of self, others, and the environment, and flexibility. Insistence on sameness, inflexible adherence to routines or ritualized patterns of verbal or nonverbal behavior, and flexibility highly restricted fixated interests that are abnormal in intensity or focus, 
flexibility, social communication, making sense of self, others, and the environment, and hypo or hyper reactivity to sensory input or unusual interest in sensory aspects of the environment. And this falls under making sense of self, others, and the environment. I'm going to start with that making sense of self, others, and the environment. What is it? What are we talking about? Part of that bowl is theory of mind. Theory of mind is understanding others' perspectives, intents, desires, or beliefs. And toddlers really don't have a lot of empathy or theory of mind, but they're beginning to develop a little bit of sympathy and empathy. Affordance is a term I came across in doing research for this book, and I really liked it. It explained some things to me. I used to do initial evaluations, and it really came to light here. Affordance is the match between the person and the environment that results in actions. Buttons are for pushing, holes are for filling. The seemingly intuitive understanding of the function of behavior. When I used to do initial evaluations for early intervention, it seemed I would find two groups of children. And I especially saw this when I was doing maybe the fine motor tasks of stringing beats or using a pegboard that's on that these items are on some assessments. And there were some children that would just pick up the bead and know that it went through, that the string went through it, that peg just went into that pegboard. And there was another group of children that would look at it and have no idea they would need a model. And this was despite the fact that neither of the none of the children had ever seen these materials before. So that to me really explained affordance. Sense of self and self-awareness are pretty, pretty similar depending on the frame of reference um, that you're using. Understanding others' intentions, that's something we see a lot in children with autism, that they often don't understand others' intentions. And a lot of times I see children get a label of having tactile defensiveness, which may be correct, but sometimes I see that it's just they don't understand when I'm taking their hand that I'm there to help them, so they don't really understand my intentions. Motor planning is somewhat related to uh, the affordance, and that is when motor planning is coming up with an idea, coming up with the steps to make that idea happen, and then sequencing those steps so that that actually does happen. Sensory processing is another important ingredient in this mix mixture. We all learned in our early school history here that what those five senses are. Many of you know about the other two that OTs talk about and other professionals as well the vestibular sense and the proprioceptive sense, both of these which deal with movement and um, where we are in space. All of us fall on this continuum of being hypo-responsive or underreactive or hyper-responsive hyper and overreactive. For example, some of you crave movement and love roller coasters, while others of you may be more like I and really don't like when those receptors in our inner ears get too much stimulation. We all must learn to attend to sensory stimuli, and over time we learn what to tune into and what to ignore. We often see children who don't attend to sounds, even though their hearing tests are fine. Many children we see attend to sounds, but not language. There are children who do not turn to their names and who often have limited receptive skills, yet they run into the room and they hear a certain show coming on. For these children, teaching listening skills has been very helpful. Some children tune out sounds because they're hypersensitive to them, and others tune out sounds because they're underreactive to them, meaning it takes a lot of sensory input before the sounds register. Some children get stuck on visual stimuli and don't shift well to auditory stimuli, or vice versa. It often takes a lot of ongoing assessment to figure out a child's sensory system. Sticky attention is now discussed as being a red flag for autism in very young children, and is something we should be on the lookout for and address. Just as developmental domains such as gross motor and fine motor have component skills, so do the areas in our framework. The skills that make up making sense of self, others, and the environment are attends to sensory stimuli, tolerates sensory stimuli, shifts attention, imitate actions, and follows directions. Attending to those first three, well, the first three, attending to sensory stimuli, tolerating sensory stimuli, and shifting attention need to be in place before the other two will really kick in, imitating actions and following directions. I'm not going to talk about routines in which we can embed skill development. The wording in our slides reflect when we discuss routines with families. They're the coaching strategies, so they're the wording is how we might describe what we're suggesting to families and 
caregivers. Most of us are only in home schools and daycares an hour or so a week, so our job is to coach. We want to help them facilitate development and work on outcomes within their routines. As you can see, there are a variety of ways to work on these skills during bath time. For attending to sensory stimuli, for the auditory sense, we can talk about body parts that are being washed, the warm water, and bath toys. We can make up a song about washing. We can make silly sounds when drying the child. For olfactory or smell, we could use a variety of scented bath products. For tactile proprioceptive at deep pressure, we can vary the pressure when washing and drying. We can provide a massage after bath. For visual, we can provide a variety of colored containers to fill and dump. We can use bubble bath or tablets to change the color of the water, or we could blow bubbles near the child. Similarly, we can work on tolerating sensory stimuli during community outings. We can, for auditory, describe sounds the child will hear, such as an approaching siren or train. For gustatory or taste, we can provide taste of new foods when going out to eat. That's interesting. I found that some children are more willing to try foods at a restaurant than they are at home, and that's often because of that flexibility issue. For olfactory, if walking by something that has an unpleasant smell, we can playfully say, yep, that stinks. For proprioceptive, we can help the child jump over the cracks in the sidewalk. And for vestibular, one thing for children who don't like to swing and get that motion, we can, as a first step, put the child on our laps and sit on the swing until they tolerate that and then very gently begin to move it. Here's some examples of routines in which shift attention, shifting attention is embedded into diapering and dressing. We can show the child an item used in diapering routines, such as a clean diaper or the wipes and name them. If the child doesn't look at the item, we can move the item to the child's visual field and then to our mouths so the child looks at the item and then to us. When putting the child's socks and shoes on, we can hold out the article of clothing and wait for the child to extend his or her foot. If the child does not do so, we can tap on his or her foot. We can help the child shift attention to our voices by being playful and building anticipation, such as by saying, I'm going to kiss your nose. It's amazing that pause in the middle works really, really well because a child will hear the person stop speaking and say, hmm, they stop and often shift the eyes. Here we have an example of a routine in which imitate actions is embedded. At bedtime, it's a really nice time to work on blowing kisses, hugging stuffed animals, or holding, holding hands for prayers for imitation. Example of routine in which following directions is embedded. How about book time? We can give a direction such as get the bunny book. During the actual book reading, we can say turn the page. We can say go put the book away. And I really like to do some direction following with the pictures. Touch the apple. I like to do this using books that have a lot of the same picture on multiple pages, such as the spot books. It's really nice to try to figure out how to get a lot of repetition in in a short amount of time so that the child feels it's just a natural part of the routine and it doesn't look as boring. But in a book with spot on each page or an apple on each page, this is much easier to do and much better tolerated for the child. Bart's so now going to go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I said Bart's now going to talk about another component of our model, flexibility. Thank you, Merle. Flexibility is another area, uh, another area on our diagram. It's the ability to adapt to changes and make adjustments in the way we respond. Flexibility is a component in so much of what we do. Infants and toddlers must learn to adapt to variability, not only in their sensory environment, such as with movement and temperature and lighting, but also to variations in routines and the different ways that caregivers interact throughout the day. So here are some examples of routines in which flexibility is embedded. So making changes to the routine is important um, to practice that flexibility. So for example, change the route when walking around the neighborhood when you're out in the community and vary by walking or riding in a stroller or a wagon. Something you can do in the car is to vary the song sung or the videos watched. When in the grocery store, you can vary who, push, who pushes the cart 
um, or what type of cart is used in the store. One family that I went to the store with wanted help in changing who pushed the cart or who was allowed to push the cart. So when both mom and dad went to the store with the child, the child wanted only mom to push the cart. And we were able to change that by beginning with dad counting one, two, three, and mom lifted her hands and dad gave the cart a playful push. And over time, the child accepted dad's push for longer and longer periods of time. And he was eventually able to allow either parent to push him. Let's talk now about building skills that support social communication. And, and these are early developing skills. We've listed a, a, some of the important skills and the next slides will illustrate a few examples of how to incorporate these skills into daily routines. So those skills are to look into others' eyes, to imitate gestures, sounds, and words, to use gestures for a variety of functions, to use words for a variety of functions, and to participate in multiple exchanges with gestures and or words. So here's an example of, of routines in which looking into others' eyes is embedded. So bath time, dressing, and diapering are often good routines for looking into each other's eyes because the child has a typical position in these routines. So for example, laying on one's back for a diaper change or in a tub or, um, you know, or standing or sitting to be dressed that can facilitate looking into each other's eyes. So some ideas to try is to play peekaboo with a towel or a clean diaper or the child's clothing, um, use predictable language uh, that repeats and sensory social games like tickle are wonderful to incorporate into these routines. When dressing the child, you can position him or her so she can easily see your face. I worked with one parent who would dress the child with his back to her. So he would lean against her while she was dressing him. And just by turning him around toward her, we were able to change the routine by him increasing looking at her so much more. Imitating gestures, sounds, and words is another important skill. And here we're talking, we're gonna talk about that next, but here's a chart of gestures across different functions. So we can use gestures to protest, we can use them to request, and we can use them for social interaction. Roughly on this chart, they go from the earliest developing, which are on the top, to the later developing skills, which are on the bottom. And gestures are really important to work on. They're the foundation for early communication and they set the stage for how the child will learn to use his or her body to convey communication messages. Later, those gestures are often accompanied by sounds, which then sets the stage for development of words. So here are some examples in which imitates gestures, sounds, and words are embedded. Um, many children like to help clean. So a great way to get imitation of gestures, sounds, and words may be in, in chores. So in household activities, you could have the child help wipe the high chair tray and you know provide a cloth for the child as well as you wipe and say, wipe, 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 or watering the garden, model the sound of the water running as you water, and then hand the child the hose. Caregivers will not always want to incorporate children into household activities. Sometimes the activity will take too long or the child might make a mess, but when the time is right, household activities can be a routine to use for skill development. Some examples of a routine in which um, gestures uh, for a variety of functions is embedded. Um, for during playtime, you could place some desired toys out of reach to encourage reaching or pointing to request. Um, you could also embed gestures into pl pretend play, such as those to represent sleeping or eating or drinking. Some examples of routines in which using words for a variety of functions is embedded um, include uh, grooming and hygiene. So for example, when brushing the child's hair or teeth, you could sing a song and pause for the child to fill in the words such as this is the way we brush your teeth and ask or brush your hair. And you can ask now what? Once the child knows what comes next in the sequence, what do we need or now what? Um, in addition to the examples here, we can also model exclamations like uh-oh and comments 
Um, I often use the same word that a child will use to request. So for example, if they say cookie, then I will use that word as a comment um, while the child is eating the cookie saying, oh, cookie, you have a cookie, yum, cookie. So the, the child used the word to request and then I'm modeling the word as a comment. Um, keeping in mind the suggestion for a variety of communication functions will help us help parents whose children are sometimes overgeneralizing some signs like for example, more and please are typically overgeneralized. And while at first the child uses the sign for more please and it's very fulfilling, those general signs may quickly become a challenge because the child's overuse of them um, prevents the lack of practice of other more specific vocabulary words. Some examples in which participates in multiple exchanges with gestures or words are embedded. It includes bedtime. So we can talk about the events of the day that were fun for the child, or we can ask relevant questions and comment about the child's statements. It may take a while to get to this level of skill where that child participates in back and forth. Um, as we know, some children with ASD may not be verbal. So we might augment communication with signs or picture exchanges exchange or other low or high tech augmentative and alternative communication strategies. And then, oh, I'm oh, going to hand this over to Merle who's oh. going to talk about regulation. So regulation is in the middle of our diagram because it's influenced by and influences the other three components. We need to help families and other caregivers find strategies to prevent dysregulation as well as to regain regulation and can do so by helping them to determine if the dysregulation is being impacted by making sense of self, others in the environment, flexibility, or social communication, or any of the combination of those. Let's consider a child who's dysregulated during mealtime and maybe think about what could be occurring. This, the dysregulation could be due to challenges in making sense of self, others, and the environment. Maybe the child may, doesn't recognize thirst or hunger, or may not like the feel of the bib or the straps in the high chair, of the, on the high chair. Could be a flexibility issue. Maybe the child only wants to eat a certain color food, or only wants a specific person to feed him or her, just like in Barb's example with wanting only mom to push the grocery cart. It could be a social communication challenge. The child may not be may not be able to communicate his or her likes and dislikes regarding the food or its presentation. Um, I'll go back a second here. Um, looking at this sort of brings up a, a similar concept. Um, Barb and I are both BCBA, BCBAs, behavior analysts, and behavior, behavior analysts talk a lot about the function of behavior. And this is similar to looking at the function of behavior. If we take a child who likes to throw food and hear that child might be throwing food because he or she likes to hear it's flat when it hits the floor or likes to watch it fall. It might be because the child only wants white food. So that might be the function of the behavior, um, which falls under flexibility. Uh, it might, might be that protest saying, I don't want this. So that's why the child's throwing it. Or it might be communication by saying, I'm all done. So looking at the function is very similar to looking at the reasons a child is dysregulated. Um, if we miss the function of the behavior, the child becomes dysregulated, often because we aren't understanding that child's intention or communication it might be misinterpreted. So we have many tips that we teach parents and other caregivers to help them prevent dysregulation. Consistency is so important for all children and for children who have autism, consistency helps with predictability which often helps regulation a lot. So the first one is be clear, what is a choice and what is a direction? We want to avoid saying, can you, will you, or do you want to? We really are giving a direction because those are choices. Choices are important. Um, children need choices, but when we're giving a direction and it's not a choice, we need to be really clear. Telling a child twice, consistently and then helping him or her and having that expectation that a direction needs to be followed after two times is really helpful. I know most parents, including myself, when my son was little, um, I would find when I'm in a good mood, I would give more chances. If I was in a bad mood at the end of the day and maybe a tough day, I wouldn't be likely to give as many chances. 
And for children who have regulation issues, this can be really confusing. Why did I get five chances to do it last time? This time I only had one. So telling a child twice and then helping him is really helpful. Um, I also like to use the phrases, do it or I'll help you, because then the child knows what's coming. When possible, give two alternatives when a child can't have something. For example, if a child asks for a cookie and you say you can't have a cookie, but you can have a banana. Often just with one option, the child gets upset because they didn't want the banana, they said they wanted the cookie. But if we say you can have a banana or an apple, that gives the child a sense of control and those two options are often better. Not all the time, but often. During transition, saying bye-bye or all done to whatever the object is or the activity is helpful. And when appropriate, focusing on what is next rather than what the child is leaving. For example, if bye-bye park, it's time to go in and get your drink. Uh, I had a little guy I was working with at a daycare, and whenever they were going for the walk, they were all holding on to that cute little rope that kids use at daycares. Um, and this little guy always stopped to pick up rocks and to look at flowers. And you can imagine when everybody's holding onto the rope and that child stopped, it was like the domino effect, and often many kids started falling. So it wasn't very good for anyone. I taught this little guy to say, high rocks, buy rocks, high flower, buy flowers, and it worked beautifully. He would go buy everything and just say hi and bye, and it was cute because many of his peers started doing the same thing. During challenging routines, we want to use small steps and potent reinforcers to help that child be successful. We want to tell the child what to do rather than what not to do. For example, instead of saying don't climb, we want to say something like feet on the floor. We want to count to 10 for turn taking and dislike routines such as wiping the face. Um, Barb talked about counting to three and the parents switching. This is something similar where if we are wiping the face or brushing teeth, we count to 10 and always stop on 10. So at first, we might, to do, might need to do it very quickly until the child gets used to the activity and then we can slow it down. But the child knows we're stopping on 10 because there's so many things we do to children or with children and they don't know how long it's going to last. We can use a visual strategy such as an X to signify that something is not available. This is really helpful to do with putting it on the TV when it's not TV time, putting it on the door when the child can't go outside, or putting it on the snack cabinet when the child can't have a snack. It gives a visual representation that the child learns when that X is there, mom, dad, teacher, someone's going to say no. It's just really important if you do this to take it down before the child asks, because otherwise the child's going to think asking brought that X down. We want to avoid triggers, um, and we often learn these triggers from sort of experience. I worked with a little bit, a dad of a little guy who the child was upset and the father said, do you want a hug? And the little guy shook his head no. And the dad kept insisting, don't you want a hug? Don't you want a hug? And by the fourth time, his son started hitting himself in the face. And the dad learned once he tells me no, I need to just listen to that no. We also want to use prompts and systematically fade them. For prompting, um, there's hierarchies that involve physical prompts, visual prompts, being a model or using a model, and verbal prompts. And there's these prompts can be taught using most to least prompting, which is good for a new goal or a new activity, or least to most, which is best for practice. So here's an example of most to least prompting. Here's a goal. It doesn't have the whole, not the whole goal, it doesn't have the criteria on it, but Part of a goal would be when finished drinking, Lori will independently walk over to the table and place her cup on it. So a more, more sort of a, a most prompt would be mom walks Lori over to the table and guides her hand to place the cup on the table. A little bit less of a prompt, mom tells Lori to put her cup on the table. A little less would be mom asks Lori, where does your cup go? And a little bit less, mom says table. And as a least prompt, mom would just point to the table. And the opposite of this, we have the least to most prompting, and here's our part of our goal. Lori will indicate by gesturing rather than by throwing her food or screaming that she wants to get down from her booster seat. So a lesser prompt would be mom looks expectantly at Lori, shrugs like she's asking a question. A little bit more of a prompt, mom asks Lori, what do you want? A little bit more of a prompt, mom asks Lori, do you want down? A little bit more, tell me down. Next time, mom just points down and shows her what she's looking for. 
and the most prompt would be mom takes Lori's hand and helps her point down. And it's interesting that when I look at prompt hierarchies that are published and I think, hmm, it, it really varies by the child. And when I was making this slide, I kept changing things around, trying to decide, well, which one's a little bit more than another. And it really just depends on that child's strengths and needs. So one child's prompting hierarchy might look a bit different than another child's. Next, Barb's going to talk about some of our tips and hints that we've learned over the years. All right. So um, some of our staples for the recipe of success, just like staples are important for the pantry, Merle and I thought of what we think are the most important basics for the recipe of success. So some of these things are pretty straightforward. For example, the child must be engaged and regulated for learning. Another is that function of behavior must, you know, is important. Um, you have to consider that and developmental appropriateness of challenging behavior when determining the consequences. So we, Merle talked about function and how important that was with the example of eating. And then also when we have challenging behaviors, being sure that we are considering what is developmentally appropriate to help that child learn to change those behaviors. Um, when targeting communication, we want to consider the modalities. So for example, gestures, sounds, words, signs, pictures, and the vocabulary that will be powerful in a variety of settings. For example, words such as eat, mom, dad, ow, or come or go. Um, common examples of using the sequence of development as a, as a framework are for those children who maybe know their ABCs and they know their numbers and colors and shapes, but they don't yet use those functional words between people. It's important also to help the child learn common nouns and verbs so that the child can make sentences to use words to make his or her wants and needs known. Um, so those just concentrating on the foundation skills, filling in those gaps when there's splinter skills, and then using the knowledge of ASD to guide is really important. It can be difficult to access routines during our visits, but it's so powerful to do so. So embedding learning in multiple routines across the day um, it, and considering what is functional and practical is really important. Sometimes if you can't get to those routines during your session, talking to the parents or caregivers about making a plan might be really valuable. Collaboration with all team members is critical to ensure that everyone is on the same page as much as possible. And that's your EI team members, um, you know, other staff, medical providers, teachers, etc. cetera. Um, choosing meaningful and practical ways to measure progress is important. We can have a lot of data, um, but the data that we take needs to reflect family priorities and reflect two ch true changes across the world. And of course, generalization is what I'm talking about so important. We want to vary the people, the setting, and the materials, the words, and the prompts that you are using, always cognizant of fading. And I believe now we are going to open up for questions. All right. Excellent. Um, that was a fantastic presentation. Um, we have tons of great questions. Um, I know we also have tons of listeners as well, so um, just bear with me for one second while I situate myself here. Um, okay, I guess to start us off, um, we had a listener who said that they have a couple of families that are not willing to see a developmental specialist. Um, and do you have any tips for them um, to help encourage uh, that um, help encourage those families to see a developmental specialist? Well, in my experience, I've certainly run across this a lot. And I've had some families who say, I don't care if my child gets a label or not. I you know I really don't want a label right now. And I can respect that. Um, I feel an obligation if I have a family to bring up that I see red flags for autism. And I certainly say that I cannot diagnose. I'm not a qualified professional to diagnose, but I see some of these red flags. So I do bring that up. And I know some people feel differently about whether or not to do that. 
but I feel an obligation to say to a family, I, I want you to know this information, and it certainly is a hard conversation to have, but I feel it's up to the family at that point if they want to do it or not, but I still feel like I need to bring it up and give that family some support and sort of take their lead as I bring that up. Um, and I'll just talk about, you know, the child's strengths and needs. Um, it doesn't change what I do as a professional, whether the child has a diagnosis or not, but it certainly is important the family sort of hears that this is a possibility in any case. Yeah, and the only thing I would add to that, I mean, is Merle is saying that you meet the family where they're at. And one strategy that I've used to address that is to revisit the conversation. And I think Merle's saying essentially the same thing, but I I often find ways to bring it up and, you know, just try to cultivate readiness for maybe that next step for the family. Um, let's see, we have another listener um, who's asking if a child with autism can have only sensory processing problems. And not the social communication. Um, in order to get a diagnosis of autism, a child would have to get the criteria from the DSM-5. So it would not just be some social, the sensory processing, it would be those, that social communication and um, the child has to fit. You can sort of do Google or whatever browser you want to use or a site you want to use. Um, the, the DSM-5, you'll see a list of those descriptors and it will tell you sort of what, what that child needs to get an autism diagnosis. But a sensory processing problem itself would not give a diagnosis of autism. And also it's on the slides that you can use that for reference. Great. Thank you, Merle and Barb. Um, let's see. We have another listener who's asking, um, what would you do to help a child um, when dealing with unexpected situations? Uh, do you have any tips for that? Uh, that's, a, that's a good one. Barb, do you wanna answer that first? Or would you like me well, to? Well so some of the strategies we've used is, you know, we've tried to make them less unexpected if possible, um, you know, by giving some warnings, um, if at all possible, maybe practice even flexibility when things are unexpected. Merle? Yes, I, I, what came to my mind as you were saying that was sometimes like if I were building with blocks with a child where I would accidentally knock it over on purpose and like uh oh and sort of real playfully sabotage and some people don't like that word but just really playfully work on that flexibility and that unpredictability and using a sense of humor i find that a lot of times children pick up on our facial expressions and our emotions and if we think it's really funny like i would build a, a tower of blocks and i accidentally knock my own over first and then i can show like oh man and uh Using that phrase, oh man, when things that are unexpected happen was really helpful in many, many cases for me. And I would actually teach the children to say, oh man, or some other expression when something unexpected happens. Great. Um, let's see. Um, do you have any tips or suggestions for embedding these routines when a child doesn't yet have joint attention? Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I mean, I, one of the things I would say is that that it, within routines, that's some strategies I would focus on immediately would be working on that joint attention and waiting for the attention shift and getting the eye contact. One way that Merle and I have a lot of success with is is doing people games. So back and forth, tickle games, chasing games, um, you know, uh, uh, playfully rocking a child on, on your legs or things like that can be really effective. So those are routines too, where we have predictable routines that really help the children start to look. And I think if you go back to that communication chart, just having the child use his or her body to tell you more, rather than using that sign for more that Barbara talked about that we don't want to encourage too much. So the child likes to swing, we swing the child and then we stop and we watch and watch for that child to just bounce a little bit. And that beginning communication of, I want more of that game, those sensory games that Barb was talking about, peekaboo, um, just setting up those situations in any routine, um, doing that pausing, how can we make that routine fun? And what Merle's saying with that pause, that's often, once the routine is predictable, 
then when you pause and stop, that child will also shift their gaze to you. So when the question was about joint attention, and that's very helpful there. Let's see. <clears throat> um, we have another listener. Uh, we've had a few listeners um, actually asking about eye contact, um, but I think uh, this listener's question kind of encapsulates all of them. Um, so the, uh, this listener has heard that eye contact is important, but they've also heard that it's not essential. Uh, they're wondering if you have uh, an opinion or um, you know, some, some insight that you can provide on uh, that. Yeah, well, I, I think a lot of the literature talking about joint and shared attention, they're showing that there's an influence on outcomes. And so the greater that the skill is, um, the more favorable the outcome. So I, I think we have enough literature to safely say that it's a really important skill and to continue to try to develop it. Well, and I think you... too, um, in, in the past, a lot of people would work on eye contact by saying, look at me which really encourages following directions, but not necessarily a desire to have eye contact. So we do a lot of using eye contact as a request. So again, sort of my example of swinging, but I'll swing the child, but I stop, that child's gonna look like, hey, why did you stop? As soon as that child looks at me, I'm going to start swinging again. Um, I might be giving a child a snack. So I'm giving maybe three freebies. Here's a puff, here's a puff, here's a puff, and then I pause that child's going to look at me like, hey, why didn't you give me the puff? As soon as the child looks, I use that as a request for more. And it's a really nice way to develop eye contact that's not aversive. I know a lot of people have said, hearing from adults who have autism or maybe teenagers who say it's sort of painful for me to look someone in the eye, but I really wonder if they had those experiences early that looking at someone's eyes had a payoff for them. It was a reinforcing opportunity for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess um, kind of building on that, um, another listener was asking, um, do you have uh, an opinion on edible rewards and whether or not those are those should be should or should not be used? Well, I, I mean, I, I as much as possible, we want the natural reinforcing consequences to be what what you know uh, maintains the behavior um, so ultimately in our work we like it to be a social communication uh, reward within a routine um, but at times one might need to use something more motivating um, to help the child engage in a behavior and develop it i think when we there are those times that we have to use food that we'll try really quickly to pair that food with a social reinforcer something that's not food but then you know like a high five or a praise yay good job so that we can get rid of that food and then turn to that social reinforcer um, let's see. Um, we have another listener who said they're working with a family who just recently um, their child had um, begun headbanging and they're wondering if you have any suggestions for the family to try and prevent this behavior yeah, that's where you really need to look at what the function of the behavior is. Um, if we don't get the function right, then our, our treatment isn't going to help. For example, if a child who is banging his head because one time, well, I see this happen a lot in little ones. Let's say the child wanted a cookie. Mom said no. The child was very upset, started banging his head. The mom's like, oh my gosh, this child's banging his head. I need to give him a cookie so that he stops. So the child learns to use that as a form of communication as a request. So that is one reason the child might head bang. Um, another one might be that it sort of feels good if I do it gently or I get a reaction. So it really depends on why. And sometimes that's very difficult to figure it out. Um, as I said, we're both behavior analysts. I, became a behavior analyst after I was first a special ed teacher then an OT and it, just learning more from that behavioral sense about the function of behavior really taught me how complicated it is and a lot of times it looks like it's a sensory need but it may be much more complex it might be partially sensory it might be communication but it's really important um, and sometimes it takes someone with a lot of experience in determining that function of behavior and writing a a plan to help with that to really get rid of it. So it's very, very complicated. Let's see. 
Um, do you have any recommendations for sharing these types of tips uh, with a family who does not speak English as their first language? Yeah, um, I mean, is there an availability of an interpreter? Um, that would be one question. Um, some tips and hints are can be found in other languages. Something that I've done, I had a family once that um, they were from another country, did not speak English, and I contacted, I just sort of Googled, it was it was a family, they were Chinese, and their child was had just been given a diagnosis of autism, and they really did not understand what autism is, so I contacted just a group that, you know, uh, like a, a Chinese cultural group to see if they could provide any assistance. I also Googled just to see if I could find any literature in Chinese for this family. So sometimes just sort of looking at resources in your community to find out if they can translate or if there's anyone available to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it might take a, a coordination of multiple parties to, yeah. to assist. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have a few listeners that are asking um, about separation um, and how, if you have any strategies for children who are putting up a fight when their parents are either leaving the room or leaving the house. Um, yeah. Yeah. Something that I've done is to have that parent just hide for two seconds and come back in and make it really playful, playing peekaboo just around the corner. And then as the child gets used to that, just really progressively increasing that amount of time so that it, that child knows that parent's coming back. I also learned that my first early intervention job long, long ago, a social worker taught me that it's really not a great idea for parents to sneak out because then that child never knows when that child's going to leave. So that person taught me to even though the child might cry to say, I'm going to leave now, but I'll be back. So the child knows that that child is going to come back and again, to do it in progressively longer times. Mm -hmm. um, we also have several listeners who are um, referencing the, uh, the current pandemic and how it's affected early intervention services and how there's been a big shift to telehealth. Um, and so I guess, do you have any suggestions or tips for conducting or switching from in-person services to telehealth? And do you know of any particular difficulties that this may present um, for children with autism? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the challenges are, are definitely there in that some families learn best by demonstration. Um, you know, Merle and I have risen to that occasion by um, coming up with some cre creative ideas. Merle has demonstrated behaviors with her husband and had him play, act the role of the child and then shared those, um, those videos with the family. Um, I have, you know, tried to tape um, little demonstrations of, or on my own um, to share with families. I think the demonstration part is what's so challenging um, because it, it's one thing to talk about it with words, but to actually show families how to do different things um, is, is probably one of the bigger challenges. Uh, also, I think that what I have found is that families are stressed and um, they have many competing obligations. Often they have other children in the house who are needing to be on school, doing schoolwork, or um, they are out of a job or the income has changed or whatever it may be. So I've been really trying to be cognizant of where families are and what they can manage in terms of intervention strategies, trying to make it as simple as possible Possible, which is why the embedding it in daily routines is so important. And I think too, um, you know, just being really careful to use a coaching model is, is very helpful as well. Asking good questions, helping family, families determine priorities, and then trying to make things as functional as possible. I think one thing that we found too is to say, if, if we weren't having this session now, what would you be doing? And if the family says, well, we'd be outside, then you know, it certainly depends on their, their technology. But if they have a phone and the internet goes right out the, the door or something, that you could be in the backyard where they were and help give them ideas. It's really hard for those kids who don't sit at a table and for 
who maybe before the pandemic were getting sort of more instruction. But as Barb said, that coaching model where we're really teaching the family and the caregivers and being part of those routines and as, as much as possible to do it during the sessions, but also to, as Barb was saying, families have a lot of competing things they're doing. And if that session just needs to be shortened, just you know, sort of get, get the most you can, but it, it certainly is challenging for everyone. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, we also have a few listeners um, who are asking about um, food and feeding. Um, and so do you have any suggestions for increasing and increasing and expanding food options or um, or and also working with uh, a child who doesn't want to eat or try any f try any foods? I'm not sure if that's new foods or just any. Um. Oh, goodness, that could be a, a whole couple hour talk, I think, for, <laughs> for feeding. But um, I, I really enjoy working on behavioral feeding challenges with kids with autism. Um, and I find that I have the most success when I start with something the child eats and real gradually try to introduce something new. So a little girl that Barb and I work with, I just was helping her family with this yesterday, where this little girl is very selective. Um, she was eating applesauce, her mom tried to give her a peach and she spit it out and that was the end of that. So one thing I suggested was that her mom grind up some peaches and then have it in a bowl or mix it with some applesauce, so just a little bit of peaches and some applesauce mix in the same bowl, but next to just plain applesauce. So even though this child is self-feeder, she does accept being fed. So I have the mom feed her three bites of applesauce and one teeny bite of the mixture to see if she tolerates it. And if there's just a little bit of peaches in there, it's pretty likely the child will tolerate it. So, and that worked pretty well. And the mom was able to do three bites of applesauce and then one bite of the mixture. Well, this little girl got smart and looked and noticed that mom was taking it from another side of the bowl and then refused. But um, I suggested the mom really put some reinforcements of some praise in there. So every time she took a bite, including the applesauce, great job and just keep that praising. Um, it started to work. So what this mom's going to do is increase the amount of peaches, decrease the amount of applesauce on that one half until finally it's just pureed peaches. Then we know that she tolerates that flavor then we can start going to the texture by having them pureed peaches and just teeny, teeny, tiny bites of the peaches that are, are textured and just go back and forth and go really slowly. So I hope that makes sense. But there's, if somebody wants to email me, there, there's a lot of, of really useful tips for, for feeding that I found. And it really depends on the child, but some, it's, it's a challenge, but uh, it's a lot of fun when you get that success. Okay, let's see. Uh, we have another listener who is asking, um, how do you get parents to understand foundational skills like eye contact and joint attention um, before talking will start when the parents really just want their child to start talking? Uh, that is that is uh, something I deal with all the time. And it is really difficult to help families understand um, that these foundation skills are critical critical for talking. And sometimes what I try to do is reframe rather than using words to talk about communication. And so if you use that word communication, I think it's easier for families to understand that you have to look to learn, you have to imitate to be able to imitate words, you have to be able to use gestures, you know, it's the first way that children understand to use their body. But these are messages that I repeat over and over and over again. And I will often just say very candidly, I know you want him or her to talk. And I do too. And then I have I reiterate the steps to get there um, because these are very important variables for supporting communication. So that is some of the ways that I've. Those are some of the ways that I've managed that. Um, I do need to repeat the message. It is a tough thing to understand, um, and so we we talk about it a lot. Um, let's. See. going through we have quite a few questions that have come in <laughs> um, um, we had a listener who was saying how can they um, encourage families to keep routines at home um, I lost the point but I think that was um, 
and it might be because some families, a lot of people will say, well, they don't have a routine. And I think it's, it's routines are such a subject, it's such a subjective word because one person's routine might look very different in a family that looks like they really don't have any routine. They probably have some sort of routine. It might look really different than ours, but you know, they, they must most likely get the child dressed. They do diapering, they bathe, they have meal time. They may not have the same routine every day and it may not be sort of, again, it may not look like ours, but they are doing routine things. So to try to figure out how to embed skills in what they're doing, rather than sort of putting a routine that looks like one I might do into their life, I would try to take what their life is like and try to embed some of these skills into what they're already doing. The other thing I think about when I think about routines is, you know, we have the the classic bedtime, bath time, et cetera, but, you know, people get their mail out of the mailbox, they give the dog a snack, um, you know, I have one family that, um, you know, walks down the apartment stairs and then they clear the envelopes that have come through the drop mailbox and look for their own and sort of a sorting activity, um, they go in and out to the playground, so there's a lot of routines that are smaller than what we might think of as those bigger blocks of the day. Even getting in and out of a car seat can be a routine. Um, so I try to look for all those things that repeat in a family's day. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, so we'll just take just a couple more. Um, I apologize to anybody that we did not get to your questions. Um, we had just over 600 people in today, so there were a few, quite a few questions that came in. Um, so let's see. Um, we have a listener who is asking, um, what about parents who resist the coaching model? Um, do you have any tips for getting them, getting their buy-in um, and really getting them engaged with it? Yeah, one of the ways that I start to work on a coaching model with families that are um, resistant is I try to give them a role, um, one of which is to answer my questions. Does that look like the same thing with you? Um, you know, tell me, you know, what what is his favorite thing? Um, what, you know, what should I do next? What do you think? Or I may ask them to watch for a certain behavior and let me know and have them fill me in almost like a reporter. And very often that more, um, you know, information gatherer role can be a really good way to start the coaching model um, and then start to, you know, work on smaller ways to get the parents involved, such as, you know, I'm going to show you and then just for a second, you, I'll ask you to try it. Let's see how it goes with you. So just those very small ways to help um, develop that coaching relationship. Um, but first, uh, having the families give me information can be very helpful. I know, Barb, something you do a lot, too, is to ask the parents, can you help me with this? And mm -hmm. something we've sort of done for families where they might be on the couch, maybe texting or just sort of not really engaged in the session, besides not even wanting to be coached, it's just hard to engage them, is to maybe have the child, oh, go show that to mommy, go show that to daddy. Mm -hmm. Oh, and sort of have the child approach the family. Um, if a child's not following directions, that makes it a little bit tougher. But I think that what I learned from Barb is having that parent help me, um, again, over sort of using technology and doing virtual sessions, that's a little bit tougher. But in a way, that's easier to get that coaching role um, because we can talk to the parent if, if they know that session is for them and that child may not even be sitting there. But when we're actually in the home, just using that, that family, as Barb said, is sort of a helper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think we can take two more and then um, and then we can wrap up here. Um, so we have a listener who says they have a kid, they have a kiddo who's talking and naming about 20 to 25 flashcards, um, imitating words, but not yet using verbal language socially. Um, so she's not communicating with an adult, and she, but she will talk to the, um, she will talk just not with not to another individual. Um, so do you have any strategies to help uh, improve the communicative exchange with others? Yeah, that's a really tough one. And and sometimes that can be a really hard bridge um, to cross. So the the figuring out what are those really important powerful words might be a way to start. So eat. 
um, you know, mama, calling mama, and at first even making it a game where it's peekaboo, mama, let's call mama, and then later having the child be able to call for attention, or go can be a really powerful word on the swings, um, or, um, you know, any kind of running game, you know, tell mommy go. Uh, so really focusing on that very early on, what words are powerful between people, and practicing a lot is so important. That's a great question. That happens a lot. And if those, any of those cards, those flash cards or items, hopefully that that child wants, that as soon as that child says that word when shown the picture, to give that child an item. So maybe if one of the words is, one of the pictures is cookie, and that child likes cookies, that as soon as that child sees the card says cookie, to present a cookie, so that child sees like, wow, this person can meet my need with the use of this verbal exchange. Yeah. Um, okay, and we'll take one more question. Um, so this listener is asking, how do you have any ideas for how teachers can be supported by leadership um, when they do not have any direct experience with autism? Meaning the teacher doesn't have experience or the leadership does? Um, not 100% clear. Um, I'm going to go on a limb and say the leadership does not have experience. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I think educating the leadership probably about what autism is as best as possible. <laughs> so I know it can be sort of sticky. That's the only thing that came to my mind. How about yours, Barb? No, I think that's important. And, and even um, if the provider is is dealing with the leadership, possibly offering something very casual like a lunch and learn or some handouts that might be available or even websites, um, maybe even presenting the case as what's functionally happening. So Johnny in this classroom is having this difficulty and presenting to the leadership, you know, here's some education around this and maybe problem solving that particular issue would tap in to that leadership training functionally for something that's happening right then and there and perhaps motivate them to learn more. Okay. Um, I did just get an update from that listener and they, I took the wrong limb. They were referring to the, if the teacher doesn't have experience with uh, autism. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think it is so hard, for example, for uh, maybe a regular ed teacher who has a child with autism in his or her class and has not had any experience to support. So I think going to, for the leadership to sort of find, I imagine that teacher is probably frustrated and asking, what can we do to support you? I know this is new for you. What would be helpful? And if the person doesn't really know that they need help, um, that can be challenging, but maybe just educating, saying, oh, you might find, I found this resource. Maybe this would be helpful for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Merle often asks directly, what can I do to help you? And I think sometimes we might offer visual supports or other kinds of supports, but just saying literally, what can I do to help you? Um, maybe helps the teacher identify um, what it is that is a particular problem in the classroom. That can sometimes be a better solution in, in, the, in the sense of it would address directly what the issues are each day. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So I know there were a few questions we didn't get to, um, but we can follow up with those listeners afterwards. Um, so thank you everyone for submitting those questions. Um, so I think I just have a few more things to cover. Um, and I know I did get a bunch of questions asking about the slide handouts. Um, you will receive a follow-up email tomorrow uh, that will have a link to download the slide handouts from today's presentation. Uh, so at the end of this uh, slide presentation, there will be a link for you to get a um, coffee chat certificate. And you'll also receive an email tomorrow that will have a link to get your certificate as well. Um, and again, just a reminder, at the end of this presentation, you'll be prompted to complete a short survey. Um, we'd love if you could complete that and just let us know what you thought of the presentation today. And you'll also be entered to win a free book um, of Barbara Merle's uh, Autism Intervention Every Day. And uh, if you are interested in purchasing any other products from Brooks Publishing, we are offering a 20% discount um, using the code COFFEECHAT. And you can just enter that uh, discount code in when you're checking out and you can get 20% off of most products from Brooks Publishing. And if you are looking for additional professional development opportunities, we have tons of coffee chats um, that have 
already been completed and we also have plenty more upcoming. Um, so you can watch all of those recordings and see our upcoming lineup um, at this URL here. It's bit.ly forward slash Brooks Coffee Chats. And we also have even more resources. Um, if you are looking for any uh, additional resources to help you during the um, COVID-19 pandemic, um, I know a lot of, as we're all learning, things are very quickly shifted to virtual and um, telecommunication. So we've tried to put together a list of resources to help um, all sorts of educators, including recommended readings, downloadable resources, and professional development webinars. And those can all be found at that URL there. Oh, thank you, Mar thank you, Marl. And this is your um, URL to get your certificate. Um, again, you'll also receive a link in the follow-up email tomorrow that will be sent out. Um, but you can just go to this link here, and you can access your certificate. Um, but then, if you if you um, don't go there, you'll just get a reminder in your email tomorrow. Um, so I think with that, we'll wrap everything up. Um, I'd like to say a huge thank you to uh, Merle and Barbara for a fantastic presentation. Um, and thank you to everyone that attended, um, asking excellent questions. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Everybody stay safe. Mm -hmm. right. Bye. Bye. Bye.